what I didn't achieve was the ability to carve out a life as a musician. But what did come as a consequence, it gave me kind of a lot of character building. And it was my first true transition where I turned my whole image around. Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast focused on helping you create a more fulfilling career. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you gain the clarity, confidence, and courage to overcome the challenges of making changes to your career so you can do more meaningful work and enjoy your professional life. In each episode, I feature people who have decided to reinvent their careers to do more fulfilling work. We talk through their unique personal stories, the challenges they overcame, and the lessons they learned along the way to help you relaunch your own career. Today, my guest is going to explain how he relaunched his career from being a tax consultant to a rapper, then agency founder. We'll discuss facing your fears during transitions and how to take control of your career narrative. Afterwards, during today's Mental Fuel, I'll address a listener question about how to balance the work you're currently doing with the work you want to be doing. Happy holidays! In a few days, I'm heading back to the United States to visit some family and friends over the holidays, but I did want to get one more episode of Career Relaunch out the door so you can hopefully listen to this during your travels over the holidays. Today, my guest on the show is Deepak Shukla, who by day runs Pearl Lemon, an SEO agency, and by night runs ultra marathons, plods around Ironman events, and hangs out with his cat Jenny. A few years ago, he left his corporate job at Deloitte as a tax consultant during the height of the recession to become a rapper. Over 150 songs later, after running his own music studio with over 200 international clients, he traveled the world to over 50 countries while running two businesses and even trained to become a British soldier. Now, one reason why I really enjoyed talking with Deepak is first off, because I've never actually met anyone who's shifted from tax consulting to rapping. And also because he's such a big believer in taking action and learning as much as you can from the chapters in your career, even those that may not have gone the way you wanted them to. And I think you'll hear his positive philosophies come through pretty clearly during this conversation. You can get all the show notes from today's episode at careerrelaunch.net slash 51. Deepak spoke with me from London. Well, good morning, Deepak, and welcome to Career Relaunch. Great to have you on the show today. Joseph, I'm really excited to be here. So we got a lot to cover today. I want to talk about your time when you used to be an accountant at Deloitte, why you left that behind to become a rapper and what that scene was like for you. But I was wondering if we could just start off by having you tell us a little bit more about what you're focused on right now in your career and your life. What I do for a living is I'm I'm 32 years old. I run an SEO agency. And that's what I believe I'll keep doing for some time. What I'm about, though, is just, you know, finding ways that I can really try and help give back others and explore. So I want to come back and talk a little bit more about your agency. For those people who aren't familiar with SEO, can you just very briefly explain what your agency does related to search engine optimization? Our agency, if you were to Google us, folks, is called Pearl Lemon, Pearl like you'd wear around your neck. What we do is ultimately help a business rank on Google for competitive search terms. The most easiest example is if you're a real estate broker or agency of some kind, you may have listings that go up in the area of, let's just say, for example, Toronto. So you may want to rank for a variety of words. If there's something called like Harbour Lane, Toronto, and you have a listing there, it's natural that someone will search for that initially if they're thinking about buying. So then you would pay me for the service to make sure that your website or your listing comes up at the top of Google when someone searches for something very specifically like that. So that's what we do and and what people pay us for. Cool. Yeah. I've actually used an SEO expert for this podcast and I definitely noticed a difference in my rankings on Google. So this stuff definitely works. So I know that you haven't always been the owner of Pearl Lemon and I do want to talk more about that at the end, but can you just take us back in time? And I was thinking we could start all the way back to when you were working at Deloitte and uh, then maybe we can move forward from there. What were you doing at Deloitte? And then we'll, we'll jump into your life as a rapper after that. Deloitte was um, 2009 or 10. It was just after I finished university. I majored actually in English literature. So I was like basically the only one in a class of 300 that went into work in the financial services space. 
One thing led to another. I ended up walking into a graduate role as a tax consultant on their prestigious graduate program at that time, especially also having kind of Indian parents from India. I'm, I'm British Indian. Everyone was super pleased that I was at Deloitte because it seemed to be the very you know good thing to do with my college or university background. But I walked into there and I absolutely hated the place. What did you hate about it? I was not a tax man. I had no interest really in tax as I discovered. And why I didn't discover that before was because in the internship, one, they wine and dine you, but also two, it was just the kind of route that society, i.e. university, what everyone else was applying to and what people perceived to be or saw as success working at Deloitte. And it was a great job, but I looked at kind of the work that I was doing, number one. And I remember then number two, going to a networking event where you get to meet kind of one of the directors. Oh, you get to meet a range of people basically that are a lot more senior than yourself. So I just remember asking uh, one of the directors a little bit about his life and, you know, work predominantly. So I thought, okay, so this is what success in this industry can look like after maybe six, seven years of hard graft. I just realized that that wasn't actually where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. Now, what I knew that I enjoyed was was rapping. <laughs> okay. Now, how do you make the leap from accountancy to rapping? Like, can you tell me a little bit more about how you realized that you loved rapping and where did that even come from? So rapping has been something that was with me since I was 15 years old. I had friends in music that I had perhaps different career or fortunately educational histories from. So really what it meant is that like, you know, I had a bunch of guys I used to roll with that I did kind of rap songs with, but these guys were not doing well academically. Some of them had been in and out of prison. Some of them were kind of dealing drugs and we were on a different path. So that path and our relationship really faded as I went to university and as I kind of went off on that adventure. So for some time, my relationship with the industry, if you will, at large kind of faded. But what didn't was my love for music that remained. And some of the songs that you've seen on YouTube really relate to the period where I'd kind of broken away from the group and I was still enjoying music. And I thought this is something that I want to do. What I didn't really understand, though, when I was at Deloitte and I walked into the partner's office to say, hey, you know, I'd like to tender my resignation. And they said, well, you know, Deepak, we invest a lot of training. We'd love for you to complete it. You can go on to become a qualified tax consultant, chartered tax accountant. You know, there's all this kind of stuff. Why don't you wait it out? And, you know, I said, oh, well, well no, I want to, I kind of want to go and be a rapper. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so my journey then began by recognizing, okay, Deepak, you want to make music amazing, but you also need to make money. And that reality struck me home quite hard. And at that time, I just thought, oh, okay, well, you know what? I'll, I'll start a recording studio. And then I can maybe have the studio, invite musicians who are my friends in some cases to my studio. We can record together and I can also charge people for the service of recording their music. And for me, it felt like, oh, this is a fantastic idea. Before we get to that, I'd love to just go back to this moment when you decided to resign. Was that hard at all for you to be able to walk away from this stable job and this industry, which I think you mentioned before, at least culturally, was seen as something that would be quite reputable and quite honorable. Was that hard for you? Or was this a pretty simple thing for you to do? The act of doing it was very easy. The emotion attached to the act was incredibly difficult for me to work with. I found that the more I remove one from the other, the easier it's been able for me to switch or turn or pivot and adjust. So what I mean by that specifically is, you know, it's like, wow, I'm going to quit Deloitte. And then my heart rate goes up, you get kind of a blood rush and all of the things that kind of surround a little bit of fight or flight response biologically. But then if I wrote it out on paper, do you enjoy being here, Deepak? My heart was like, no. And that became a very effective vehicle. Like, is this you or is this your future? Does this make you happy? You know, I'd look at the piece of paper and it was like, no, it was like, okay. It, was, it always served as a kind of reminder that, Deepak, you're not doing the work that relates to perhaps your highest value. So that was kind of the tool that then allowed me to go in and have what ultimately was a five minute conversation and then write up a letter that took me another five minutes to say, hey, you know, I resigned. 
So that was very powerful to me in reminding myself that, you know, this isn't what's going to make you happy. But then very, very quickly also kind of taking some massive action. I knew I had no idea about how to set up a studio. I knew that if I told my parents I was just resigning and there wasn't a plan in place, that would be even worse. Joseph, I just took to Amazon. I began looking up books that related to how to start a home recording studio, a guerrilla home recording studio. The second thing that I did was reach out to a couple of producers that had originally produced some of my music and said, hey, can you teach me the kind of 80-20 for how to use Logic Pro on a MacBook at that time? And I kind of began the process of setting up a studio. All of the activity came out of the action of talking to Matthew Ellis, because once I told him I'd resigned, that really lit a fire underneath my backside because it was like, wow, what are you going to do, Deepak? So that was very helpful to me that I kind of leapt before I looked. All right. So let's shift gears here now then, Deepak. Let's kind of take these one piece at a time. What was your experience like to start your recording studio? And I guess I'm mostly interested in the emotions you were feeling as you were trying to create something from nothing and walk away from this stable job to try to build something of your own. It was scary, Joseph. I recognized that this would be a little bit of a fall from grace in terms of the perception of what I was doing, which would be very quickly followed up by an expectation that, well, if you're going to take this route, you need to figure it out. And, you know, my mom and dad got married at 11 and 13, right? The first time they saw each other, they, they got married. They transitioned from villages in India where they, you know, places where they were born without birth certificates, no electricity, no doors, no windows. And, and you know, this isn't kind of hyperbole. I, I went and saw my dad's village when I was 18 to see where he grew up. And what they had been taught and what they knew through their kind of migrant story and coming to the UK was like hard work. You know, my dad still works at Heathrow Airport as a driver. My mum still works at the local supermarket. You know, they had the same jobs for years, decades. This transition of me moving from stable employment into something that was extremely unstructured was not something that they would understand because it was just so alien to what they knew and it was nothing like what any of my siblings do so it was scary it was mostly scary and how much did you think about that as you were going through this so initially it was a little bit crippling We come to a quote by, I think, Tony Robbins, I believe, and I think it aptly describes how I was able to move from that feeling of being crippled to maybe taking some of those actions. The quote goes something along the lines that, you know, change only comes when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. And I did not enjoy my work, Joseph. It was pretty clear to me that this wasn't me fulfilling my potential in that environment because of the reality of what the day-to-day was alongside, you know, looking into the future and thinking, Deepak, you're not going to do well here. This is not for you. Get out now. Let's talk a little bit then about now that you've decided you want to move on, you've got the recording studio. Let's talk about your days as a rapper. Like what was the rapper scene like? And did you find that to be more naturally easy for you or were there also some challenges there? The interesting thing about not only transition, because transition is a form of growth, that new environments, of course, lead to new problems. So I was, as a British Indian at Deloitte, someone who was culturally extremely accepted because British Indians go and work at places like Deloitte. It's what we do. I then transitioned to being a British Indian rapper. That is something that British Indians don't do. (laughs) 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 Now, so I got a lot of validation as an engineer because then It was about me producing uh, music of others, but it was a bit more difficult to perhaps get some validation or recognition as a musician. People are a lot less interested in hearing or talking of my music, even though that that was the primary purpose that I was trying to fulfill. That really just meant that you need to really work harder, I presume, to kind of get recognized and appreciate that that often is also a path to to success in some cases because it meant I had to work harder, which isn't a bad thing. And I remember my first, um, it's still on YouTube. I don't think that that's a link that I've sent to you, but there's a music video with me, with my former rap group. Um, We're called Dark Side Soldiers. These are the guys that I was kind of going, rolling around with, so to speak, from like the age of 16, 17. And 
I'm in the video and I'm the only Indian in the entire <laughs> video. I don't know if there's anyone who isn't of African or Caribbean origin or who's mixed race. So there was me who was kind of the standalone. And that was quite indicative of, of the environment. Not that it's a problem, it was just the reality. People were always, of course, surprised when they heard that I was a rapper. And I definitely had more success as a recording engineer than I did as a recording musician. Can you explain what that was like for you to be a minority in so many ways, not only racially, but also being outside of what is typically what a British Indian would be doing with their days? I had a lot of problems emotionally, I think, Joseph. I didn't really appreciate that it was going out of the frying pan into the oven because I had also never dealt with the lack of structure in my days. You know, I've resigned from Deloitte. I suddenly had no money because any remaining savings were going into building up the studio. But the studio didn't have any income. I was at my parents' place. The Deep Impact Recordings, which is the name of the studio, started in what was ultimately the room next to my, my parents' kitchen, my mum's kitchen. So these musicians would come through through my back garden and my mum would be cooking like dal or uh, chapatis <laughs> and then they would go through into the actual studio. So there were times where a couple of musicians would turn up and they'd walk right out because they'd be like, <laughs> you know, WTF is going on. And, you know, that meant in some ways that was, you know, it became a huge win because it meant that the music I produced had to be really good. And that was the focus. And if people could get over that initial hurdle, I then began to become known as how have you been to Deep Impact Recordings? He's that Indian brother, you know, the one that records those tunes in his mom's kitchen, man. You can cook up some wicked stuff there, man. <laughs> and this is what actually what I perceived to be a big problem became a huge strength because people would laugh about it. They're like, you gotta go see Deep Impact Recordings. He's bagging, he's that Indian brother. He's really good fam. Go eat some dal with his parents. Cause my mom would come in and talk to the musicians. <laughs> and within the African and Caribbean culture, it's very natural to be respectful of mothers. So actually, whilst these people were doing whatever they were doing in their private lives, professionally with my mum, they were so wonderful and polite. And my mum was like, brilliant, your friends are so amazing, d so, <laughs> <laughs> so there was all this kind of stuff going on. And there was me kind of in the middle of it trying to figure out what is going on? What am I doing? And it was also quite lonely, Joseph. Lonely because one of the things that I think often gets missed about any form of like, let's call it coaching, tuition or pr music production is it's, it's very giving. So in that hour that I was producing someone's music, and these are like 18 year old rappers that, you know, are trying to make their fortunes. It's all about their music. It's all about them. So I'd be doing this maybe six to eight hours a day at times. And I was left feeling completely emotionally exhausted. I didn't really understand or have anyone that I could communicate about this with. There were some days where I just cried, dude. I felt very lonely and I felt that I didn't really connect necessarily that well with anyone else in the industry when it came to talking about what my true passion was, which was actually making music rather than the production of others' music. That was definitely something that I kind of struggled with amidst this whole space, you know, not knowing if I'm going to make money tomorrow. So I need to say yes to every booking, but then being left by myself and being alone. So, so it was this kind of weird vortex of emotions. How did you then make the transition into focusing on what you really did love, which was to actually make your own rap music? Number one, I stuck it out, meaning that I committed to trying to produce music for these others. I, as a consequence of being able to get musicians in, I became better at the production of music, meaning that I began to develop some regular clients. That meant a little bit of stable income. That meant that I could carve out space to work on my music. The stable income led to a regularity of faces, which also led to me actually getting referrals, which also led to me developing some friendships with some of these musicians that did come in. So all of these things started to come together. That made me feel a lot more fulfilled. <laughs> Now, I've got to ask you a little bit about your music itself, because I did go to the YouTube channel that you shared with me, yeah. and I did watch a few of your videos. And speaking of sticking things out, I checked out one of your videos called Winners Get Bruised. I think the line, and I think you could probably say this better than I can, but uh, you said, winners get bruised, winners get broken, losers just quit after one bad moment. Can you just explain what the inspiration was behind that particular line in this particular song? 
I love the, the chorus. I have my kind of little gym. You know, winners get bruised. Winners get broken. Losers just quit after one bad moment. Sinners just talk. Sinners just walk. So lay down on your cup. Yeah. Winners get bruised. Winners get broken. Losers just quit after one bad moment. Sinners just talk. Sinners just walk. When they're going get stuck. Your men will call. Just lay down your cup. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> you know, and I recorded that particular song, actually. Um a few years after I left kind of the studio behind actually in terms of timeline. It's really interesting that that was the song you picked because for me, one of the things that transitions have taught me is that hang in there, stick it out. The true mark for me of how I measure a person and how I also measure success is your ability to come back from abject failure, or your ability to endure environments where you're not able to demonstrate your skill set or your strong suit. These kinds of situations and, and that song just really, yeah, no, it takes me back to ultimately, did I succeed as a musician? Well, objectively, no, right? I failed because no one's heard of me. I've got kind of a history and an archive in on YouTube, which of course we post rationalize and, and a lot of these other things. What I didn't achieve was the ability to carve out a life as a musician. But what did come as a consequence and I didn't really appreciate it at the time but I did when I made this song which was later in the timeline was that you know what wow it gave me kind of a lot of character building and it was my first really true transition where I turned my whole image around to being oh Deepak yeah no he's uh you know the dinner parties with my parents would be oh you know my son he's an accountant you know my, and my dad's Indian accent oh my son's working at Deloitte it's a very good company he's, he's an accountant <laughs> now brilliant um you know these were the conversations and these are the things that my dad would tell his people at work you know in those days my dad didn't tell anyone that I'd left yeah that song winners get bruised when it gets broken it brings back a lot of memories one of the other lines in there was I put my blood and sweat into every song I make, then upload to SoundCloud and only get three plays. Put my blood and sweat into every song I make, then upload to SoundCloud and only get three plays. Did you have that experience? And if so, what was that like? Yeah, life and experiences have, of course, you know, they toughen you when you go through stuff. I look back at it now and I smile. Uh, at the time, it sucked. At the time, it sucked. If people were to look at Deepak Shukla up on SoundCloud right now, they would see that there's literally over 100 songs on SoundCloud. Just my music, right? Not my podcast or my Sia. It's my music. It's me rapping. And um, I didn't succeed in the journey of becoming a recognized rapper. Part of me wonders whether that even was meant to be. You know, was that the journey that I was on? I'm, I'm not really sure. I know that I love music and I know that what's also interesting is less than 5% of those songs are actually commercial songs. So I never really transitioned or went on that journey to try and make music for a mass market audience. And I'd say that, you know, if people objectively look back, did I succeed in becoming a recognized rapper? No. Was that my intention? I'm not sure. Even this call reminds me that music is still a love of mine. What I'm really most pleased about and looking back at all of that is that I can say, you know what? I tried. I really made the transition. I, I left it. I, I started the studio. It, you know, no, I, I didn't become a rapper, but my God, one thing is definitely absent when I look back. I don't feel any sense of regret about the path. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that really stood out to me as I was watching your videos was that I would really struggle to put myself out there like that. And I think that for people who listen to this show, one of the challenges that people struggle with is they've got an idea, they want to quote unquote, put themselves out there. But the idea of putting themselves out there is incredibly scary. And it feels incredibly vulnerable. I'm just wondering, what was it like for you to put out your first music video? Like, what was it like to watch yourself on there? It felt exactly like the moment that people feel when they go to approach perhaps a pretty girl at the bar and you have so many butterflies and you don't know what you're going to say and you are almost just waiting for yourself to screw it all up. That was the experience of 
when, for example, a musician would come and produce some music in my studio and then I'd ask him to listen to one of my songs and he'd be like, you could see him begrudgingly say, okay, cool but really just doing it to be polite. And then me thinking this song needs to be so mind blowing that it needs to knock him off his chair. And, and you know, my, my, my music isn't mind blowing, but it's really important that you still go out and go and show someone that is an industry expert, you know, something that you've made. It's an integral part of getting better at the work. It's important to recognize that. And I, God, I didn't always do it successfully, dude. You know, there's a hundred songs on SoundCloud, but there's probably another hundred that I've lost or been scattered or that I did decided not to upload and, and lots of other things. So I think that it's a continual journey that people go on. And, and for me, it's like the experience of pain tolerance. Like when you do, for example, ultra marathons or anything that's extremely painful physically, that the only way to build up your tolerance is to go and do more of it. The SEALs do it in their training, continual exposure to high pressure environments. It's always been hard. It still is hard. And that's also why I go out and still try and do stuff that I know that I'm not good at, like swimming, because actually I find it transitions and it bleeds into other parts of my life. And it helps me do some of the other work that can, you know, hopefully lead towards some of the success I'll have in my career. One of the last things I want to talk about, Deepak, is some of the things you've learned along the way here about career change. And it relates to something you're talking about, which is picking yourself back up and bouncing back if if maybe your music video doesn't land that well with, with somebody or it doesn't get that many views. How do you go about bouncing back and how do you go about dealing with things like rejection? With rejection, the best way to manage it is to avoid dwelling and Avoiding dwelling is to go out, means for me to go out and take new actions. So spend a very small moment of time wondering what could you have improved about the process rather than what went wrong when you fail at something. So, oh, wow, that sucks. Or rather be like, okay, well, what was the feedback? Okay, fine. Let me take that and let me go out and do something new or something different. But action and activity is a practical way for me to move forward from, from failure. And the second thing that relates to transition, like relaunch, what's been very liberating for me is realizing that Deepak, the world doesn't care about you. You could dance on the street naked and within two days, everyone will have forgotten that you were ever there. And that really helps me because it makes me recognize that the person who cares the most actually is me. You know, Joseph, I've been on maybe a dozen or so podcasts and everyone has had access to my YouTube videos, but you're the only one that's taken the time, for example, to look specifically at some of my rap songs. And what that reminds me, and it's quite helpful in reminding me is that, ah, oh, Deepak, you know what? You can still put everything out there and people are so busy with their own lives that you can relaunch yourself in any way you want. And the biggest obstacle actually is yourself and realizing that no one cares. For me, it's been very liberating. Yeah, that's really interesting because I know we talked about that before when we spoke prior to this call is this idea that we are all so focused on what other people think about us and we think that other people are thinking about us. But actually, people are really concerned about their own image, their own issues. And yeah, I found that really liberating, the idea that actually people aren't as focused on you as you may think that they are. I agree. I agree. And the one acid test that people could do is think of someone who's in their network and then think like, let's just, you know, Luke, for example, is Luke's my best friend, right? How often do I actually think very carefully about Luke's career decisions, about what he's doing? Not that much. I just think, okay, cool. I'll, I'll ping him to be like, Hey dude, let's go have some beers or Hey man, what's up? How was your day? Um, one of the things we talked about when we chatted prior to this recording is about the fact that you're able to shift and reframe your personal brand and professional narrative to help open doors during each stage of your career change. And I was wondering if you could just share a couple of the ways that you've managed to take control of your own personal brand and your own career narrative. I know you mentioned before there was a major shift between accountancy and then becoming a rapper. How did you manage to remake your identity so quickly and so effectively? When I switched from my recording studio and, and that kind of all got put to bed, I then launched within um, two months a tutoring agency. So I went from being 
someone who was deep impact the rapper to being Deepak Shukla, the academic teacher and tutor. I did a couple of things. So number one, practically speaking, I would take, for example, my professional resume. So that would be LinkedIn. And I began to focus upon anything that could support the, the narrative that I wanted to communicate. So, okay, Deepak, you want to move from being a rapper to being a tutor. Have you ever taught anyone anything? And people be like, oh, well, no, I haven't. But, but actually, everyone has taught someone else something. Everyone assumes that if it's not a paid exchange, therefore, it's not experience. But that is not what work experience is. Work experience is experience of doing the work. It's, it's, if you take it very literally, then you quickly recognize that you have done some things to support the narrative you're trying to communicate. Furthermore, I would extend that onto a place like YouTube. If I was to give you a URL for my tutoring channel, there are multiple videos there that I go on and talk about the process of studying, the process of tuition, the process of education. So I took all of those things and then I used that to really angle and position my resume. That's what's become very powerful for me, which is, okay, where's the space that you're trying to go into? Right now, I'm an SEO guy and I took that exact same process that I've just described, positioning my LinkedIn, producing some content that relates to SEO and making them the massive focus of what I communicate to the world. Very cool. Yeah, it's very helpful. And I really do think that a lot of times people sometimes feel a little bit uncomfortable about reshaping their career narrative and they kind of feel like, oh, I'm misleading somebody or I'm not being accurate about what I've done. But I actually think, yeah, like what you just said, it's about being selective and being intentional and choiceful about the things you do share to help build a specific narrative, which I think it's slightly different. So, so yeah, very helpful. Well, I want to wrap up today, uh, Deepak, with what you're up to right now. And I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about about what's next for you at Pearl Lemon. And I'd love for you to start, first of all, with just telling us about the structure of Pearl Lemon, because I remember back from my marketing days, I'm used to working with agencies that are in a physical office, but that, that's not how you're set up, right? Pearl Lemon, um, we're a team of seven. Um, I work from my local cafe or my flat here in, in London a lot of the time. Adina is based in London. We've been working together for two years. I've met her four times in two years, even though we live less than five, 10 miles apart. Oh, wow. You've got Samil, Raj, and Atit who are doing some of the production work in India. You've got Melanie in New York, Rebecca in Texas, uh, Lincoln in Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica. So the team is remote, the team's distributed. Why? Because of my 20s, I think, Joseph. I spent most of my time abroad, traveling, living, exploring. I started this business with the same question in mind, which is Deepak, how can you run a business that's distributed and, and remote, number one? Number two, how can you scale trust? Number three, how can you convince someone to pay you invoices at the start of the month instead of the end of the month? And again, that meant number four, everything came about to, well, position yourself as an expert in the space, produce a lot of content that also relates to or publicly put out you know, stuff about your personal life and try and build things that way. So starting with those questions I sought to answer in mind, that has helped the business kind of grow and, um, and be where it is today. Um, you know, again, I've never met any of my clients, Joseph, I think. I met one once four months after we started working together. And as to the future, um, Joseph, naturally I want to continue growing the agency to do what it can do. Um, and then outside of that, I like to tinker. I've got an online course launch that's happening at the moment. We've just made our first four or five sales. So that's really interesting. So there's these things that I'm exploring and experimenting with alongside the main focus of growing the agency um, and, and continuing to experiment and explore, Joseph. Okay. And any plans to get back into the rap scene? You'll be the first to know. I okay. definitely I definitely will promise you this. I'm going to I'm going to record at least one more song again and I will send it to you once it's done on the basis of the inspiration you provided me through asking me such such amazing questions and taking the time to go through my music. I, I feel so grateful about that. Well, if you do manage to do that, then we'll definitely include it in the show notes. And if you get it to me quickly enough, we can maybe even include snippets of it in the actual show. So oh, wow. there's some okay. incentive yeah, there for you right there. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, if people want to learn more about Pearl Lemon or if they just want to learn more about you and check out some of your music videos, where can they go? You could literally go to deepakshukla.com. You'll find everything about my agency as well as my personal life there. So YouTube Deepak Shukla or 
just Googling my name works perfectly. Perfect. Well, we will make sure that we include a couple of those links in the show notes. And if you don't mind, I might even include one of your YouTube videos that we've referenced during this call. And yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. So thank you so much for your time and for walking us through your really interesting career. Uh, Joseph, thank you for taking the time to ask me such excellent questions. And uh, yeah, I'm excited and nervous at the same time to see my music of all things in your show notes. <laughs> and so I hope you enjoyed hearing Deepak's thoughts on character building activities, giving yourself an opportunity to learn from your mistakes and how to take control of your career narrative. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'm going to answer a listener question about how to position yourself when you're trying to keep your current career going while laying the groundwork for your future interests. Before we get to today's Mental Fuel, I'd like to thank Grammarly for supporting this episode of Career Relaunch. Built by linguists and language lovers, Grammarly's writing app finds and corrects hundreds of complex writing errors so you don't have to. And as a Career Relaunch listener, you can download Grammarly for free by going to getgrammarly.com slash relaunch. This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge to help you move forward with your own career goals. And for today's Mental Fuel, I'm going to address this listener question from Ben in the UK about balancing your current career interests and future ambitions. Hi, Joseph. It's Ben in the UK. As I'm sure um, many people do when making a move into a different career path. I'm kind of starting to move in a new direction. Realistically, that's going to take a lot of time. So it's not really financially viable to completely walk away uh, from my old career straight away. So my question is really um, in terms of how you position yourself, for example, on your CV or on your LinkedIn profile, how do you find the right balance between remaining relevant to people who you're working with currently, who and help sustain you financially while still showcasing um, what you have to offer to people who can help you to realize your 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 new career path in the in the longer term. So yeah, thanks very much, Joseph. Um, really enjoying the podcast, and uh, look forward to the next one. So thanks so much for the question, Ben. First off, I want to say that this question about how to keep your current career going, especially if it's helping to pay the bills with laying the groundwork for the work you want to be doing more of in the future is a question that comes up a lot and something I wrestled with myself when I started my own business and also something I still kind of wrestle with as my work continues to evolve. And so I completely get this tension between not wanting to walk away completely from what you're doing right now to what you hope to be doing. Now, I'm not sure if you're full-time employed, Ben, or if you're working independently, but I'm assuming from your question that you have some control over the work you're doing or the people you're serving. So I'm guessing that perhaps you're a freelancer of some sort. And so a couple thoughts on this. First, how I think about this balance. And second, how this ends up playing out when you actually communicate who you are and what you do to others. First off, I always think it's useful to think about where you want to be in the future, let's say a year from now, and ensure you're investing some amount of time into pursuing those opportunities. And I'd recommend getting very clear with yourself on how much time you want to devote to pursuing these future endeavors. And I'm talking about a certain number of days or percentage of your time you want to carve off. But purely on a practical level, I also think it's really important to ensure you're still maintaining and not neglecting your bread and butter work that, as you said, helps pay the bills, even if you don't necessarily enjoy that work as much or plan to do as much of that in the future. So let's just say you're a freelance writer and most clients are hiring you to write about technology topics, but you want to be writing more about sustainability. I think it's important to start building up your portfolio of writing on sustainability topics, even if it's only one out of five articles, then maybe over time that becomes two out of five and then three out of five until you're comfortable shifting over. The second thought on this is to try and figure out if there's some sort of unifying overlap between your current work and future work so that the two streams of work don't seem completely unrelated. Now, if they're completely unrelated, that's okay. But if you can find some sort of a common thread between the two, that'll make your life way easier when you're trying to explain what you do to other people. So for example, going back to that freelance writing example, maybe you're known as a technology expert, but perhaps when you write about technology, it can be about sustainable technologies. 
Or to give you a personal example, some of the first talks I gave were actually on industry branding topics, which eventually evolved into personal branding topics, then eventually into personal career topics. Finally, when it comes to how you actually position yourself on LinkedIn or other social media platforms, there are a couple things to keep in mind. First, I think it's always helpful to be as focused as possible, anchoring yourself somewhere so people know what to do with you and to avoid spreading yourself across too many domains. At the same time, I think you should anchor yourself in your current work while communicating the doors open to doing more of the work you want to be doing. So just carrying that same example forward, in your summary statement on LinkedIn or Twitter, you could call yourself a technology freelance writer who's especially passionate about sustainability or whatever future topics you hope to focus on. That way, you're creating some focus on your current work while remaining open to work aligned with your future. Then maybe over time, you selectively share more of the work that relates to where you want to go. Now, whether you want to anchor yourself in the space of your current or your future work is kind of up to you. But when it comes to marketing yourself, I would lean in slightly toward positioning yourself with a focus on the future. That may feel a little less comfortable, but that's exactly how you're ultimately going to open more doors to doing work aligned with that future. So for me personally, whenever I've tried to make a shift to my work, this lean toward the future, both in terms of the work I take on and the work I choose to showcase has helped me make the transition. But I also try to keep in mind that most of the transitions I've made in my career have taken way longer than I expected initially. So I'd encourage you to be patient and just stick with it. Anyway, I hope that helps. And if you have any follow-up question related to your specific situation, feel free to drop me a note at joseph at careerrelaunch.net. This topic also reminds me of one of the best pieces of guidance on mindset I've ever heard related to career transitions from Guy Ferdman, co-founder of Satori Prime, in a discussion with former Competitive Edge podcast host Scott Britton in 2015. And Guy said, who we are in the present moment is a function of the future we're expecting. So you should act in a way that aligns with who you envision yourself being in the future, not the person you were in the past. So this question from Ben is going to feed into this week's challenge for you, which feels appropriate for this time of year. And that's to think about where you want to be 12 months from now. What sort of work do you want to be doing more of? What sort of projects do you want filling your time? And how do you want to be spending more of your days? Then once you're clear on where you see your professional life a year from now, to embrace one new behavior that's consistent with that future. To act like the person you hope to become rather than the person you have been in the past. It could be devoting a little more time to that side project you want to have as your full-time job, or simply changing how you introduce yourself or investing in that training that creates a bridge from your current work to your future work. For me personally, I'd like to get a couple more online e-courses up by the end of 2019 focused on personal branding. So I've decided to carve off one day each week in the new year to work on developing that content. And I'm also working with a team right now to relaunch my website in January so it's ready to house this new content. Whatever you decide to do, commit to it and decide when you want to start. So I just had to end today by featuring that song from Deepak's Deep Impact Rap Days called Winners Get Bruised. And before I head off for the holidays, I just wanted to thank you for being a loyal listener to this show in 2018. We've done 20 episodes since last December, and I really appreciate you subscribing to the show. So if you have a question you would like me to field on the show, you can drop me an email at joseph at careerrelaunch.net, or better yet, leave me a voicemail at careerrelaunch.net slash 51 where you can also find a summary of all the points from today's conversation with Deepak and also check out a couple of his rap music videos, including the one you're hearing right now. Again, that's careerrelaunch.net slash 51. Coming up next time, we're heading over to Bangkok, where I'm going to be featuring a former doctor turned English pronunciation teacher. We're going to talk about what it's like to leave behind a career in medicine and what it takes to not only change industries, but also relocate yourself to a new country. 
Thanks so much for listening to Career Relaunch and a special thanks again to Deepak Shukla for joining us today. This episode was mixed by Richard Pennington, Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. I'm Joseph Liu. I'm going to be back with you the first week of January. And in the meantime, I hope you have a great holiday season and happy new year. And I feel so bruised and broken Creative uses like you stuck tokens My head hurts hard getting larger than the burger man I heard a man just murder man was too outspoken Cause he thought I'd talk but he talked too much in court Cause the game is about pain and all these leaderboards I'm tailor-made to pave the way I paint a picture No restrictions that I spit I've got a tendency to over